How many people are lucky enough to say that they've been to outer space? Maybe sometime in the future, space travel will be much more common. As we keep developing technology, we may soon be launching astronauts to missions on other planets, sending travelers out for deep space exploration, or even running commercial flights for space tourists. For now though, only a few exceptional people are selected for space missions. And today we're lucky enough to chat with one of them. Hi, I'm Taylor from WOW STEM. And today I'm talking with former NASA astronaut, Ellen Ochoa. Dr. Ochoa was the first Latina woman in space. And after her career as an astronaut, she became the first director of the Johnson Space Center. Dr. Ochoa, it's such an honor to talk to you. Thanks so much for sitting down with us today. So I'm gonna start by talking about how someone actually becomes an astronaut. How did you apply? Uh, I wrote to NASA and got an application. <laughs> and, you know, tried to find out a little bit more about the process. When I, when I first contacted them, uh, I was in the middle of getting a PhD. And uh, so I actually waited probably a couple of years or so till I finished my PhD. And then I sent in my application. What was that interview process like after the application? So NASA, of course, doesn't select astronauts every year. Um, they just, every year they look at sort of you know, how many they have, you know, what the flight manifest looks like going forward, and then they decide when they're gonna do it. So I guess a, a couple years after I sent it in, um, when they decided to do a selection. And uh, I was lucky enough to be one of the people that they invited down for an interview. and. You know, it probably wasn't until I got there that I realized that only about 120 are invited to interview out of a few thousand applications. So um, I had already made it through a, a few layers or levels uh, of the application process, which was exciting to hear about. And then we spent um, about a week uh, at Johnson Space Center. So we had a chance to you know, talk to current astronauts, which was really my first chance to talk to someone uh, in the astronaut office. Uh, we got tours of um, the training facilities and of the center. We had many different kinds of medical testing all throughout the week. And then of course there was an hour where we had an actual interview with the selection committee. For the actual process and interviewing, are there restrictions on who can become an astronaut? Well, of course, you need to have a college degree in some kind of technical field, science or engineering, or, for example, a, a medical degree. Um, and nowadays, you need to have an advanced degree as well. Um, that wasn't a requirement when I applied, but if you looked at who got selected, almost everybody had an advanced degree anyway. Uh, in terms of other things, uh, mostly it's medical um, that uh, keeps a lot of people um you know, just not able to continue, I would say, with the process. Um, if you take any kind of medication that um, that really didn't allow you to continue with the process because um, people absorb medications differently in microgravity. And so even if you have a condition that's well controlled on Earth, that's not necessarily uh, the same in space. Um, eyesight kept a lot of people out, although they've expanded what they um, uh, except nowadays, you know, at the time you really had to be 2020 without any kind of correction. Um, but, you know, if you were healthy and if you had a, a technical degree, you certainly um, were eligible to apply. So what kind of skills do you think are the most important to become an astronaut? Well, there's a, a number of different kinds of skills. I mean, obviously, um, understanding about science and engineering is um, important because, you know, the first thing you learn about is uh, really all the systems of the spacecraft that you're going to be flying. Of course, in my case, that was the space shuttle. And we were responsible for, for operating those systems and understanding how they worked, understanding how to get around issues when there were problems uh, with those systems. And then, of course, what we were doing in space um, was generally related to um, science or technology experiments. And so having some familiarity with having done that uh, was important as well. Um, but then there's a lot of skills that are just, I would say, um, important, but um, in, a, in a different kind of way, right? Um, in terms of, I think astronauts need to be both good leaders and good followers. And um, 
a lot of people maybe aren't both, or some some may not even be either, but a lot of people <laughs> aren't both because you take on different roles um, on a crew and you may be responsible for a particular um, activity or role on a crew where you really kind of are the leader. Um, and then in other cases, you're sort of uh, working for other members of the crew. And of course, you're always supporting a much bigger program than than what your your own crew is working on. Uh, well, that I think segues greatly into our next section. So we talked a bit about how you got accepted into the astronaut program. You ended up flying four different space flights, um, adding up to, I believe, about a thousand hours in space. And you mentioned it a little bit, but what were you doing while you were up there in space? Well, uh, on my first two missions, uh, we were part of a program that NASA had at that time called Mission to Planet Earth. So it was about understanding more about our own planet. And these two flights were specifically studying the Earth's atmosphere and um, particularly the problem of the ozone hole and ozone depletion. So we had a number of science uh, instruments on board in our payload bay. Um, we operated them from inside um, the shuttle um, and also scientists on the ground were able to um, you know, talk to their instruments and interact with them. So my main role, uh, we were operating 24 hours a day, so we had shifts. So on my shift, I was sort of the main science person, making sure that everything was, was going correctly uh, uh, with the science instruments collecting data. And then we also had on both those missions, science uh, satellites that we needed to use the robotic arm to deploy into space and then to grab and uh, uh, you know come back and rendezvous with it a few days later and uh, grab it with the robot arm and, and birth it back in the payload bay. So I was the primary robotic arm operator um, on both of those missions. And about the time I came back from my first flight is when they added Russia as a primary partner to their international uh, collaboration, which already included the Europeans, the Canadians and the Japanese. So I was lucky enough that my third and fourth flights were part of building the International Space Station. Uh, one of them was the very first shuttle to dock with the new station. Um, nobody was living on board yet. We didn't have a habitation module. Uh, it just consisted of two modules, one, one American, one Russian. And so our job was to transfer a lot of supplies, both internally and externally, primarily. We had a few um, secondary science experiments as well. So, uh, so again, I was the primary arm operator for that. And uh, also on those flights, um, also responsible for the transfer of equipment from the shuttle to the station. And I was the flight engineer on those two flights, which means I work with the commander and pilot during all the dynamic phases of flight, launch, rendezvous, uh, undock, uh, entry. So a lot of time in the simulator um, going through all different kinds of scenarios for that. For this science going on in space, why uh, is it so important to have these kind of scientific missions in space to begin with? Well, what you're doing in space are uh, research or activities, science activities that you can't do on the, anywhere on the surface of the Earth. So you're taking advantage of some feature of being in space. It might be the microgravity. It might be being above most of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, you know, something like that. So certainly for the um, atmospheric flights, we were taking advantage of, of being above most of the atmosphere, but using the sun as a light source during sunrises and sunsets to measure constituents um, in all the different um, layers of the atmosphere, all the different altitudes and able to measure many different constituents at once as well as measuring the amount of light coming from the sun in uh, all different wavelengths. So these instruments needed to be operated, um, you know, above the surface of the earth to actually do the job that they were designed to do. For these missions, what would you say is the hardest part of being in space? 
I, I think part of it, and um, you know, I'm particularly thinking about the flights that I were on, the short duration shuttle flights, um, very busy. Uh, because they're trying to get as much done during the time that you're in space, which is limited. Just sort of the mental concentration that every single thing that you're doing, you're really um, concentrating hard on to make sure that you are, um, you know, following the procedures closely, but also looking for anything that doesn't look right in case, you know, something isn't going exactly the way that it needs to do. And knowing that, you know, in some cases, if, if uh, something goes wrong, um, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to complete a major objective of the mission or something like that. So I could just remember, you know, being really tired at the end of the day when I went to bed and, and it's not really a physical tired, but it was just a mental <laughs> exhaustion of kind of focusing, um, you know, just really carefully on everything that you're doing. And also one of the really, um, ex you know, exciting and rewarding parts is, uh, is all the different things that you get to do and that you get to learn. What would you say is the silliest part or the most fun part about being in space? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, uh, microgravity is just a very different kind of um, uh, experience than anything that you can do on Earth. So, I, you know, anything that sort of allows you to do something that you can't do on Earth, I think is fun. You know, I can remember on my first flight, one of my crewmates weighed about twice as much as I did. And, you know, I could balance him on the end of my finger, um, you know, in space. Uh, since he was weightless. So uh, I remember getting a picture of that and, you know, just kind of um, doing things with food. Um, you know, one of the things that we did is we had some goldfish crackers. And so we let some water loose in the cabin, which just forms a big ball and threw some crackers in. So it looked like a kind of an aquarium without any walls. Of course, you still got to drink the water down and then somehow eat the soggy crackers so that they don't get anywhere else in the cabin. But uh, things like that are always, uh, you know, because you just can't do it anywhere else. Did you did you take any personal items with you up on these missions? One of the things I got to take, which was a personal item, but yet it was part of our work, was my flute. Um, I got to take that up on my first flight because one of the secondary activities that we had was to shoot a video um, about living and working in space that was aimed at kindergartners through second graders and kind of comparing what a day in space was like to, you know, what they're used to in terms of getting up and getting ready for school and that kind of thing. So we did have one shot of, well, you can still do your hobbies in space. And, and so I got to play my flute during that. So it, it went up as part of the payload for that for that video. That sounds pretty fun. <laughs> Having a little bit of music while you're in space. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I know we're developing so much new technology and amazing robotics and artificial intelligence. I imagine that it's going to be really important for the future work in space. Do you think that, and I know you already mentioned your expertise is in manned space missions, but do you think that the future of space missions is more in manned space missions or unmanned or some combination of the two? Well, I think it's always going to be a combination of the two. Um, and not only, you know, separate missions, you know, one that would be, uh, say, an uncrewed, maybe um, science mission and another a crewed mission, but actually working together. And, and you can certainly think about um, working on the surface of the moon. Um, you know, you're going to have uh, astronauts, but you're also going to have rovers. Um, and I think um, some of them will be um, mostly autonomous or could be operated um, from the gateway, which is going to be in orbit around the moon. Um, and that way you, you don't have the same uh, latency, although it's pretty small um, from Earth. But you're trying to use uh, anything that's sort of automated or robotic where that works best and then use people where that works best and, and combine the best of both to get as much done as possible. Uh, I think both have the capable capability to inspire people on the ground. Um, uh, and, and we see that all the time. Uh, I do think uh, when people see actually humans do those things, though, I think it helps people um, set higher goals for themselves. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the space arena, right? It's just that, oh, well, people can do this. People are doing this. You know, what can I think of challenging myself with doing as well? 
Yeah, I think a lot of people watching this may be interested in being a part of NASA or the space industry when they're entering the workforce in 15 or 20 years. What big questions do you think we'll be working on in 20 years or that you think we may be able to answer with these space, space missions? I think there's some, some basic scientific questions and then there's more about how can we uh, use space or learn for, um, from space to apply to things on Earth. So, you know, some of the big scientific questions are, you know, the ones that um, we've been talking about for a while. Are we alone? Um, have, is there or has there been life elsewhere? Um, you know, first in our solar system, but then also anywhere else in the universe. And I think that would really, you know, change our perception of ourselves and our planet um, if we found evidence of that. So I think that is um, probably the biggest um, question that is out there in terms of uh, space exploration. Thanks so much for talking with us today. Our conversation has made me so excited about the future for space exploration. I personally don't think I'll ever go to space, but it was such an honor to get to talk to you. And who knows, maybe someone watching this video will follow in your footsteps and make it to outer space themselves. Well, thank you. It was wonderful talking with you.